Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Michał. I work at Reality Games in Krakow, Poland. And Reality Games, we are doing games, mobile games, based on big data, mostly geo, uh, geolocation game kind of games with lots of data inside. And today, I want to show you how inside our company, inside our teams, are we doing Scala, what kind of techniques in functional programming are we using, and um, especially in the teams of, of beginners. So when somebody new to Scala even joins our team, uh, how do they start doing Scala in a functional way? Before we start, and while we wait for the more people to join us, I, I want to tell you a joke, a functional programming joke. Uh, hello, I'd like to hear a programming joke. Functional programming joke. Okay, why did the chicken cross the road? I don't know. Why? It's very simple, really. The best way to understand it comes from the idea of contravariant functor. As you probably know, a functor is just a mapping between categories that represents category structure, a homomorphism, if you will. Now, some constructions that we want to express look, look like functors, but in some sense turn morphisms around. We call these contravariant functors. As you have probably noticed, we can indeed define a contravariant functor as simply as a covariant functor on opposite categories, invoking the obvious correspondence. Of course, you have already noticed the obvious connection this has with the category theoretic generalization and so on and so forth. So this was a joke last year, very popular, and I really, really like this joke because it ma makes perfect sense about how we learn and how we teach functional programming. Because we, as humans, like to learn by example. We don't want theory at the beginning, usually. We just want to start doing something, and theory can come later, right, if we, if we want. So we start learning just by doing something with the code. And only then, when we understand some basics, we learn the theory behind that. And this talk is just about that. This is a beginner talk. So it's a longer version of a, of a normal talk, because we'll be doing some live coding and some repetition, but it's all based on example. So that's how we approach that, fast and functional. It has two parts, right? Fast and functional. Functional part is we'll be creating a microservice. The microservice with a real kind of domain that can be fit in one presentation. So it's like a presentation example, nothing real, but something that could happen, could be created in a real, or a real company. And what will be very different about this this example or this implementation of this example is that it will really be very modular. We'll be using functional programming, functional mechanics, a simple one like basic functional mechanics in Scala in order to make the service very functional. And plug and play, we'll be replacing modules inside this, uh, this um, application, this comp component, different components in the application very, very quickly. That's why plug and play will be just plugging different implementation of some modules. So uh, something that is like a holy grail of programming, right? And the fast piece of this talk has two meanings. The first meaning is obviously performance, because we'll be, we create, first create a service, and then we'll be enhancing its performance, making it better. So it uh, has more requests per second, and we'll be able to measure that. So it's kind of a bonus of this, bonus of this talk. If you can go through whole 90 minutes of, of this talk, you will learn a lot about how can we quickly, on our computer, test whether the, uh, the service is performing uh, pretty well or not at all, right? So this kind of, this kind of approach. So performance will be learning about flame graphs. And flame graphs will be our tool to go in order to rate the current uh, sp uh, specific performance characteristics of the service. And the second meaning of fast in the fast and functional title is uh, development speed. Like, so how quickly can we do something? How, qu how quickly can we create a new functionality? How quickly can we replace HTTP server? How quickly can we replace, replace HTTP client? 
So how quickly can we do those kinds of uh, exchanges in the code? And if this is very uh, modular and we can use plug and play, this development speed should also be very, very fast. I will show you how to do that and how we are doing this in real applications. So in this talk, uh, fast and functional modularity, the functional programming way, and some uh, plug and play things using a real simple Scala service. And the example I want to show you uh, is called Influencer Stats. So this is the name of the application I, I will be using. So first, some background on this application. Why do we uh, want to do it? So imagine that you are working for a company and uh, there's a new product. There's a new product coming in and the marketing team ca comes with a, an idea. Let's do something different. Let's not do the marketing strategies that have been done since like the last century, like for, for last century, like the t billboards, TV commercial, and in the press and things like that. Let's try to do something different. Let's use social media and new ways of, of campaigning products. So what is influencer campaign? Influencer campaign is uh, something when you get, have a new product in your company, whatever the company does, you uh, have to uh, get some contracts with influencers. Influencers are people on Twitter, on Instagram, on YouTube who have many subscribers, followers, or, or how is it called in this particular media, right? So if you have millions of subscribers on YouTube, then our company can approach you, or any company can approach you with, with this new product X and say, okay, can you mention this product in some way in your next post or in your next video, right? And they get money out of that, and people are really, really influenced by these kind of things currently. So we have a new product and we connect, contacted with a bunch of influencers. And then uh, what, we, what we did, we have like videos and uh, posts, Twitter tweets and things like that. And our team needs to create an application that will, will be able to aggregate those things together. So if we have like six videos, then for this particular product, our application needs to connect to YouTube, fetch the statistics for all the services, for all those videos, and produce a one holistic complete aggregation, the statistic for this particular connection. Okay? So this is our product. This is the service that we need, the simple service that we need to create from scratch. Collection of videos, how many likes and how many views. Okay? That's, that's the, 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 the application. So three requirements that are really needed, uh, business requirements. The first one is, of course, collection. is a collection of videos. We need to be able to define that collection of videos, right? Collection for this particular product is these seven YouTube videos. So ability to add and update those collections is the first requirement. The second requirement is uh, to be able for each of those particular videos in the collection We'll be, we need to be able, or our service needs to be able to fetch all those statistics for each individual video from the YouTube API. And the third, the last requirement is we have all those statistics for each individual video, individual video, and we need to just sum those things up, right? So total likes, total views, all the statistics, and return to the user. So three requirements, but of course, we can't have any application if we don't do those non-functional requirements. This needs to be an HTTP service. So uh, we need to have the HTTP web server. It's, uh, it needs some kind of HTTP client functionality because we need to connect to the YouTube API, right? And we need to have some collection storage, no matter if it's in memory or in the database or, or whatever, right? We need some storage mechanism. And of course, uh, as an instrumentation kind of example, metrics or so on, I will do, do logging. So our application needs to log things. We need to be able to debug and maintain this application, right? So as I said, it needs to be, it needs to be real. That's why we need all those non-functional requirements. And in functional programming, uh, when, you, when you approach it in a like, normal fundamental way, we always talk about pure and side effecty kind of thing, uh, sides of, the, of our code. Right? So we tend to, have, to want to have as much code on the pure side, or the light side, right? Uh, because pure functions are easy to test and easy to keep separate. This is, this is what we want to do. If we want to have maintainable code, 
we want to have very, very isolated modules. But, of course, we need some side effects in order, to, uh, for, in order to, uh, for our application to work. For example, YouTube API call will always be a side effect, and we can't really change that, right? So we also need some side effects. But functional programming uh, tends to uh, have many, many of those things transferred to the, to the other side, right? So we want to, our ultimate goal is to move as much from this right sides, the dark side of the force, or the code, from side effecting kind of things into the pure, pure world. So we want to have as many uh, things on, the, on this uh, side as possible. So when you think about that, and calculate stats is the one function that we can think of is pure. It gets some video stats and produces the aggregation. It's just a function that sum, sums things up, right? But if you think about the requirements, it's the only one that we can come up with for now. But at the end, we'll see that we will have more, more of those pure functions, because we need that in order to have maintainable code. So we need to move as much as we can to the pure side. Okay? That's our goal. But why? Again, why? I will repeat that often today. Why do we need that? To test in isolation, for example, to reason in isolation, to understand the code in isolation means uh, to understand it quicker than if it's, uh, if it's well uh, coupled or very, very coupled. And uh, of course, we need to swap components because it's like a, it's like a result. It's a conclusion from all these uh, things. If we have a separation of concerns in our, in our code, if we have isolated modules, then we can really easily swap the components. Again, the holy grail of uh, the programming, especially bigger applications. So the agenda. This is the agenda for this talk. Uh, we have just been going through the, through the introduction when I introduced the example. Now we are going through the Scala code. Uh, some, some particular code will be, do some, we'll be doing some live coding and doing this application I just, I just described. Uh, and then we will move as a bonus, as a calm down, to cool things down a bit, to the performance test. So we'll be doing some performance tests using WRK and flame graphs. Uh, so it should be a pr pretty intense at the beginning, but then it should cool down a bit at the end of the presentation, All right? So the solution that we'll be using, we'll be using uh, algebras, or we'll be using module programming using algebras. First, the model. model. Normal Scala model, so case classes usually uh, are the things that we are used using to model things. And the application I just described will use this model. We won't change it. It's just an introduction, just the first, it's just the first slide. So we'll be using a collection. Collection is just a list of video IDs, right? So a list of string. And we'll be using a case class called influencer item. So uh, our statistics are, uh, are computed from the list of influencer items, like six videos are six influencer items, six videos and, and two tweets is uh, also uh, influencer item items, right? So views, likes, and, and so on and so forth are in this in influencer items case class. And uh, the third and the last modal class that we'll use is collection stats. So the, the final statistics from our service, like how many impressions, how many engagements, and what kind of score do we give this, this for this particular item? How much impact does it get? And we start, and we should always start when we are doing a new service, we should not start with choosing the library that we use in order to create an HTTP server. Or we shouldn't be starting with how do we process metrics, Prometheus or something else or even logging, log4j or something else, like HTTP, HTTP4S, should we use, I don't know, Spring, Spring Boot? It doesn't really matter. What matters is the business logic, right? So we should start with that. We always should start with that. That's why we can prototype quicker. So we are starting with that, and it's a pure logic. Calculate, given the list of items, we need to return collection stats. So again, it's a, an example of a pure function. What we can do? We can just fold left over this list of items 
starting with collections, the empty collection, we are just getting results and items. So current, current item and current aggre aggregated results starting from collections that's empty. So again, a simple collection usage of, of Scala, right? At the end, we are just folding down the structure into one value, which is a collection stat. So that's, that's all. And this is our business logic. Essential complexity is our pure function that we'll use. Uh, we can have tests for that, even property tests. Uh, anything like that can be really uh, tested quick, quickly and easily because it's a pure function. So again, the second very, very nice benefit of uh, having a pure function of course, isolation, testability, and so on and so forth, but also readability. So you as a developer, when you look at the code, you don't have to look at the implementation, you just have to look at the, at the signature. So why, when I will be doing much more complex things, please remember that it's easy for you as a reader, it's easier for you as a reader when you're joining a new team, having a look at, at a new code that you haven't experienced previously. When you can just look at the signature and, and kind of get what the function is doing without surprises later on, that's, that's a big win, right? Because it's, it doesn't slow you down, it's, it's, it makes you faster. So, uh, pure win. This, this function is, is just that. The, the signature tells everything. This function doesn't lie. So, can we have the pure functions all the way down? Can we have them in all of our code? like everywhere we wish, right? So for example, get collection results. So now that this, this is the functionality uh, that gets collection ID, right? So collection ID. And we need to do several things with that. We need to get collection from our storage, from the database in memory, whatever we implement. But given the collection ID in a, our signature, a, a function takes this parameter we need to get a collection. Then from this collection, we need to get video ID. I will just focus on, on YouTube to make it simpler, but you know, whatever. We need this particular ID, ID, identifier in order to be able to, for each of those video IDs, for each of, the, each of those identifiers, we need, we need to call the real YouTube API, right? To be able to fetch the current statistics. And only then, can we use the calculate, the pure function that I have just shown you, uh, we have just written. So only then we can use it because only in this place do we have the uh, video IDs, the real video IDs that are fetched from the service. Okay, so, and you see those flames all, all over. Those are side effects. Those things make uh, our code uh, side effectful. So we can't really have a pure function here. So we don't, we can't really return collection stats. We can't use the same approach, unfortunately. We wish we have, but we can't. So in order to understand, in order to understand how can we solve this, this issue, and how are we solving it so far, have we, have we been solving it so far in, in Scala community, is uh, we need to, this is a beginner talk, so I will be relating to Java a bit, to get you some context, what's possible in Scala and what, what it's not, is not possible still in, in Java. So in, to, in order to do side effectful uh, things, one of the ways uh, in Java is to use completable future. Completable future is just a type that, uh, that um, makes us think or makes uh, us believe that it's, it's doing uh, some asynchronous things in the, in the background, other threads and so on and so forth, right? And only then when, when it gets a result, it, uh, it executes the lambda that we give at the, at the end. So this is the, the approach that, that we can take, and this is just the beginning of the, of the function. I will show you it later on, because it doesn't fit on one slide. But this is, this is the mechanics that we'd use. In Scala, we have a similar thing, right? So future is basically a very similar thing in, in terms of API and what's possible and how it behaves. So we, could we do something like that? So future of collection stats, Yes, we could, but I argue in this presentation, during this presentation, until the very end, that this is a too powerful, too powerful type. Future is too powerful effect type. So you say I/O then, right? This is purely functional. If it's a functional talk, the, the guy should be talking about I/O, right? Well, no, because it, it's it's too powerful. 
It's also too powerful. So yeah, I always great. It's lazy evaluated and and all that. So it's it's somehow better than than, than future in some cases, right? But if you are pragmatic and you want to have maintainable code, you don't want to use I/O in all of your code. You want to. It's too powerful. You don't want to do that. You want to use use it in as fewer few places as possible. So. I say it's too powerful, right? I/O is too powerful. Future is too powerful. Completable future is too powerful. Why do you think I say that? So look at this code. This is exactly the same piece of code uh, that implements our collection implementation, uh, impl influencer stats thing, right? So look at the signature. Signature says get stats has a collection ID and returns a col completable future of collection stats. Makes sense? Cool, makes sense, right? You look at the signature and you say, okay, this just returns the collection stats. I will go on and, and look at the other places of the code. But what, what you missed, or maybe not, but you need to look at the implementation in order to uncover it, is that somebody did something more in this implementation because they could do that. Because if you return completable future, you can always spawn a new, new thread. You can always do something more, save to the database, log something, fetch something from HTTP, check the weather, send somebody to Mars. You can always do that, because if your function, function returns completable future, you just flat map on it and you're done, right? You can just do whatever you like to do. So that's kind of not cool. That's kind of bad. That's why we don't do future, we don't do completable future, and we don't do uh, I.O. even, because the same can happen with I.O. You can do anything. It's too powerful. They are too powerful. That's why we do this F-type. F-type is an effect type that doesn't do anything. It's, it really doesn't do anything. And the F is chosen on the call side. So the user of our function will choose the I.O. Uh, the, the I.O. or any other effect type they wish, right? But we here don't expect that, really. What we expect is all those things after column. So for example, in order to have a for comprehension, we need a monad. monad. We need a flat map and map in our type. But that's all we get. We can spawn a thread here, right? Because we don't have this kind of constraint on the code. So we return f of collection stats. And f, for now, is just something that doesn't do anything but has flat map and map, so we can do a for comprehension on it. And I will be programming using this approach uh, in a bit. But first, I need to uh, tell you more about the F type and the constraints I'm talking about, and I will talk about. Because the, the thing is that I want our code to be as constrained as possible. And if you look at that, uh, we started with synchronous programming, then you know, asynchronous programming is kind of harder because threads and you know, concurrency and all those things. And then IO effect type, it, it makes some things easier because it's lazy evaluated, so maybe fewer surprises. And then we end up with the F type, right? It doesn't do anything. So it's like a jump in the, in the, into a void, into nowhere. But why do we do that? The constraints. Uh, again, a Java example of, of what I really mean. So please look at this code. So function F, function F, gets a list of A, a list of A, and A doesn't do anything. It's just, it's just A, it can't do anything. So please think for a bit, how many implementations, or what kind of implementation would you use for this kind of function? How, what, what, what are your possibilities? And this is when you are getting constrained, because you don't have many possibilities. Because you can do new A. <coughs> you can create a new A out of nowhere. Because you don't know what A is. Right? So you are constrained. In order to get an A, in order to implement this function and return A, you need to use the list that is provided. So you are constrained with what the list has. So that's the constraint I'm talking about. And it's... Uh, 
The same thing with the F-type, but on a higher level. So we want this kind of, this is Java snippet with highlights. It's not possible to do in Java, but I show you anyways. So what, what, what would be possible if Java had higher kind of types? This is what it's called, right? So this is this F type with something inside, and we don't care what F is. We don't care what, what F is. It doesn't do anything. It's chosen by the user, so we are constrained inside. We can't spawn threads. We, don't, we can't do anything. We can't even flat map before we do the more, more, more net constraint on, on, on the F type. But the, the good thing is that we are constraining ourselves inside the signature. Right? So again, as I told you in the beginning, if you look at the signature, you can probably guess what it's doing. And now we are following this kind of path. And there is a great talk from Scala World 2015 by, by Runar, Constraints Liberate, Liberties Constraint. It's exactly what, what, what I'm explaining uh, right here. So if you have your functionality that doesn't do much, then the user has more freedom has more power over how to use your functionality. But if you don't, if you return futures, then your user need to somehow, if, if they want to use I.O., they need to convert, right? Or something like that. So they, are, they have less freedoms. So let's, let's try to use this kind of approach and implement our service, okay? From scratch. Okay, so get stats. When you look at that, it's a, it's a pure function kind of kind of, kind of way, right? So we don't have f, but let's let's imagine that we we have. So we do this f type, which doesn't do anything, and of course, uh, the collection stats needs to be uh, contained inside this f function. And if we want to do a for comprehension, for comprehension. Uh, means that it's, we are sequencing all the operation inside. This, this is what we use in functional programming usually. So let's, let's try it out. In order to have for comprehension on this type, we need to say it's constrained with monad, right? So it doesn't do anything, but it can do, have flat map and map, and that's why we can use for comprehension. And now let's implement, the, implement our service. So we have collection ID. We have collection ID, and now what we want to do is fetch the collection, the real collection from the storage or from whatever. But uh, notice how we focus just on the business here. So we don't care about how it's implemented yet. We just care about uh, what we need. So what we need? We need some kind of uh, this type F to has this collection ability to, to view collections, collection view. And we need to implement that. How do we implement such a, such, such a thing? Uh, so it's a trait, collection view, and it needs to have a like fetch collection kind of method. It gets collection ID, which is a string, and returns this F. We still, we will be using F everywhere, because we can, and we are constrained. Anybody can choose whatever F is. F of option of collection, right? Because collection can, can, uh, can be not found, for example, in the storage. So we are kind of encoding this, this kind of error as an option to make things simpler. And of course, we need this F over here. And uh, that, that's, that's how it looks like. So I'm just resetting this to, to see what's, what's happening. Uh, uh, yeah. OK. Collection view, this is exactly the same, uh, the same implementation I show you. Collection view, fetch collection, a collection ID F of option. And then we're coming back to our implementation. So now, as you can see, we have this collection view uh, over here, and we can use it. And of, in Scala, you know, this is kind of mechanics. Uh, in order to get this uh, collection view from F, we need to do something like that. Fetch collection, collection ID. But it, uh, it, it looks kind of bad. It, it, it will be better. In, in Scala 3, but for now we need to use some kind of uh, help. And the help is in order to, to make the code better, to not be uh, such uh, implicitly, uh, to not have implicitly everywhere, we will use this kind of hack, this kind of beginner level hack, so that you can see what kind of, uh, th what kind of things this type class annotation does. Uh, it's not done really here uh, as it should, should be done, but it works. It works and you, you can, you can see how this mechanism, the whole mechanism kind of uh, works together. And that's why 
so what, what, what we can do now is we can have something like that, which looks nicer, it's more readable, right? Just by adding this annotation. So we'll be using this kind of approach uh, with this uh, simulacrum uh, type class. So now when you look at, at collection type, you will, you will see that you have option of collection, right? So that is what we, what we want to have. So now we have the collection fetched from the, fetched from the from somewhere in type F, which can be asynchronous and all that, uh, all that things. So we, what, what we need to do, we need to get video IDs from this collection. And this is a pure value that, is, uh, that has all the answers inside, so we need to, don't need to fetch anything. And it's an option, so we just get uh, the videos out of it and get URLs, all is empty, to make things simpler again. And, and uh, have the happy path it's, it's not, it's, if those things are missing. So we get a nice list of strings, which are list of video IDs. So if our collection has like six video videos on YouTube, then video IDs, uh, we can use them to fetch from the YouTube API the current statistics. How do we do that? We need some responses, right? We need some responses. So we just get video IDs and map them with some function. And this function should, uh, should take uh, take a, a string and return the statistics, right? Somehow. So again, this is a, a side effect thing. So we need a video client, which we need to implement. Video client. It's not implemented yet. We'll use exactly the same approach that I show you. So trade, uh, video client, and F, right? So you, you see, I will be repeating those, those things because it's like a mechanical way of, of thinking, but we are starting with business logic. And the def definition is, uh, of the function is uh, fetch video list response. That's, that's how it's called. And uh, collect, oh, sorry, video ID, right? And collect, oh, sorry, v video list response. So that's how it looks like. Uh, video res response, that's, that's how it should look. Response. Okay. And now we can use it. Video client is there. We can just say video client. So we've our type F has this functionality now. We can use. And again, it's very very constrained, right? So again, uh, the user of our function will will choose it, but it, they need to have those constraints on their type chosen type F in order for our, for the whole thing to compile, which I'll show you in a bit. And we, uh, we just, just do fetch, right? So what we did here, it's kind of, uh, we got this list of strings, which are video IDs in the YouTube server, and then we map them with the fetch video response that we gotten so far. So what's the type of it? The type of it is list of F of video list response. But inside the full comprehension, we need to have the one type that we are in, in the context of. In this case, we are in the type, uh, in the context of F, not the list. And uh, in CAD, we have something like a sequence that flaps those types around. It flips, flaps, flips those types around. And the, the type is the, the, the right one. So we had list of F, now we have F of list. And now the whole thing is, is cool because we got just a list of video list responses. And that's kind of, what we really wanted to, to, to have. Now we have the last line of our code, uh, which is getting the items out of the responses, their influencer items. So we have this helper function over here in line 22, and we, we are mapping that with this resp response to items. It doesn't, 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 really meet, doesn't really need to uh, do anything, response to items. Yeah, and what we get here is, sorry, what we get here is we have this, uh, this functionality returns list of lists, so we need to flatten that, and of course, uh, if we have something like that, we need to just we can just replace it with flat map, but it's still a pure function a response uh, into list influencer. You can see it in line 23. It's just mapping and 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 creating a new influencer item value, and now the last line of our code is to use our calculate, pure function that we implemented at the beginning. And the whole thing yields the F value. So again, implementation on one screen, 
and it, it's, it's the whole implementation that we need for our library. So no HTTP, no hammock, no HTTP for us, no libraries at all, no, no, no logging even. Okay, but we need some logging, right? So let's do the same approach with logging. So we just say, okay, we need our type F to be able to log asynchronously, for example. We don't care, let the user choose. And, uh, and yeah, we can do exactly the same. Well, we need to create it, logging. So exactly the same, type plus again. I'm repeating myself so that you are uh, comfortable with the whole process. Logging F and info, something like that, right? That's something that we, we can use. So just as a simple example, just an info level messages, okay? And now we can have, again, summon the uh, logging for F and do info on the this message, uh, so some kind of message, right? But I won't be doing strings here, I have those already. So trying to fetch collection with ID collection ID, right? And of course we can have more logs if we want, like fetched collection of collection and uh, more of them. Uh, so I just added a bunch of logs here, just put them here, and this is end of uh, the story. So this is the, the whole implementation of our service. The next step is just use that, choose the, the type I/O or whatever, and uh, we'll test the performance of it. We'll choose the, the implementations later on when the compiler makes us to choose them. So that's that's the whole that's the whole thing. That's the whole approach. So what we did is we first introduced this collection view, right? In order to we ha we had a collection ID. And then we needed to fetch the collection from the storage. So we created this algebra that's called collection view with type F as a type, so it doesn't do anything, and used it in our for comprehension. Then we just got some transformation, pure transformation from a collection, videos are inside this collection, and got these video IDs. And then uh, we used video client. We again created an algebra for that, that returned F type. So somewhere, maybe asynchronous, maybe not, whatever. And uh, we just use that to fetch all those video IDs, uh, video statistics based on video IDs that we provided. And then uh, we got the items out of the responses, so pretty mechanical, again, pure transformation. And used our pure function as the last step because we got all those you know, statistics and they just needed to be computed and aggregated. Yeah, and of course we needed some logging, so we did the same, exactly the same approach. We just added the, the algebra for our logging, which just included one, uh, one piece of, of method, and that's, that's kind of all, right? That's uh, how it looked like. So the whole implementation on one slide and this is exactly the thing that we won't be touching anymore. So th this is all. We implemented that and we'll be switching a lot of things, but we won't have to change anything on this slide until uh, ever, okay? Not until the requirements change, of course, but on, during this pre presentation, they won't change at all. So again, the same thing. When you, you can just look, okay, this is the whole implementation, but you can just look at the signature and it won't lie to you. It, it doesn't do anything more than just that. It needs a flat map, it's getting some collections. They don't. So what, what you can induce from that is that it doesn't change collections, for example, right? It doesn't change collections, it just gets some collections and fetches some things uh, from the video server and does some logging. So based on the signature, you, you already have all those things. And now, how do we use it? So let's, let's see how can we use that, that thing in our main application, okay? So let's go to main. We have a simple main. Uh, as I promised, we'll be doing everything, almost everything from, from, from scratch that's concerned with the architecture of the application. So main is uh, some configuration that we get from application conf using uh, type safe config. But then we need some kind of server, right? And this is, because this is a main application, we, we can't just use algebras. So let's see Aka HTTP routes. How many of you have used ACK HTTP, ACK HTTP in, the, in the projects? Please raise your hand. ACK HTTP? Okay. What else? HTTP4S? Cool. What about play? 
play. Okay, yeah. Okay, so AKHTP, majority of you, or majority of the, of the vote, so cool uh, that I chose this, this one. So this is the strategy that we can use, purely functional, uh, not purely, sorry, functional strategy. So you have functions that return routes. And we are focusing on this get collection. In order to create a get collection route, which is collections path, collection ID, get method, we need to be provided with a function. So with a function that takes string and returns IO of option of collection. So and this is exactly this, the, the same thing that I was talking about. So this is a small, small server, a small route implementation, and future is just here because Akka requires future. So that, that's what I said before. Akka requires future, so we are uh, kind of, it's not constrained at all, so we are not so powerful. We can just choose whatever type we want. We need to work with futures. But in order to constrain the, the, the future here, so not let it out uh, anywhere, we're just using I.O. to make it lazy and do, do the transformation and save to future. But that's all. When you look at this get collection, we can use it in the Akka HTTP server. So Akka HTTP server looks like that. Uh, it serves the collection stats. Based on the collection ID, which is a string, serves the collection stats. And the same approach, right? A functional higher order functions. So functions that are getting functions uh, as a parameters. So as you can see, we are using those routes, routes here. And in order to get a collection, so get a collection, need the function from string into IO of option of collection. And we have something similar, right? We have, we have something similar, our collection view which we, which we just uh, wrote, uh, has exactly the same signature, exactly the same, uh, very similar signature. String into F of option of collection. And here, again, is re what is required to create this route is string to IO of option of, of, of collection. So we, what we can do is we can do exactly something like that. Collection view, and we can fix, so we are users of this code right now, we can we can choose the F type. The F type will be IO. And implicitly get it from uh, the external world and use it. Collection view, fetch collection. So this is exactly the function that we need. So here, the F becomes IO at the call side, right? And that's all. So that's, that's kind of the whole server implementation. We can just use it in, 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 uh, in main. So routes are different functions. This, uh, this is uh, one function serve that, does, that uh, works on I.O., even though it's Akai HTTP. So I.O. Uh, is, is pretty uh, compatible with F. And now main. How to use that? So we are saying new Akai HTTP server, the one that we just created. We are providing the host and port from the configuration. And we say serve. What, what do we need to serve? We need to serve the, we are providing the function from string to IO of collection stats. It looks similar to what we just implemented, right? Which one is it? Which one is it? Is it the statistics one? So let, let, let's go, let's see the statistic. Get stats, what it does, it takes collection ID and returns F of collection stats, right? So here, we, uh, it gets string collection ID and returns uh, IO of collection stats. So the same thing we can do, we can just choose the IO here. We can fix the type or the, or the word over here. And of course, uh, at the end, we need to, because it returns, we will return uh, IO unsafe on sync in order to run it. And now the compiler tells us exactly what kind of things we are missing. So now the compiler are helping us. So we build the whole application, the whole server, and all that, and but we still are missing some pieces. So for example, we're missing a logging of IO, right here at the, at the far right of the screen. We are missing logging of IO. So we need to provide the compiler with logging uh, of IO. Have we implemented that? Logging of IO, I, I, I don't recall. So we need to do that, right? So we need to implement the de default logger. And this is just a class. This is just a class. Uh, it extends, of course, uh, the logging of F, we say it's IO already. Now we are using that. So a logging is just this uh, algebra we, we provided, right? A logging info from the message into F of unit. But now we are providing the interpreter, interpretation of this kind of algebra. So default logger, it needs, uh, it needs those, those two, those one, one thing. 
Uh, yeah, doesn't work as well, but we'll, we'll manage. So it doesn't return nothing, it returns IO of unit, and it will uh, be fine. And what we need here? We need some kind of logger, right? So we need, and we'll be using SL4J, private logger, uh, well, logger, logger, and we'll just using logger factory, get logger, default logger. And we can just info on the message, and that's all. Right, so we, what we just did is we moved this kind of normal synchronous or asynchronous, it doesn't matter, it depends on your log by XML, the configuration, but we don't care here, it's all in I.O., so we can choose whether it's synchronous or asynchronous, whether it does something or not. But default logger, it just locks everything, right? Locks everything it's provided. So now we can, now we can use that in, in main new default logger. So the first, the first is done. Now what's, what's missing? Uh, video client, right here, logging is already there. Now video client, video client is missing. So we do the same, exactly the same thing. So it's repetitive, I know, but th that's, that's how we don't make mistakes, right? We, we, we can't make mistakes because, because compiler are, are, is helping us with that. So video client, video client, again, the same thing. We are fixing the type as IO and we need some kind of HTTP client, for example, Akka HTTP. So let's create Akka HTTP video client uh, from scratch, but because why not? Akka HTTP video client, and it will get some YouTube URI. Of course, it needs some YouTube uh, AP, API call, API key, which is a string. And uh, okay, of course, it needs to extend video client, right? of I.O. And if it extends it, it needs some, again, some methods. And we can see that we have those right here. What it, what it uh, returns? It returns I.O. I.O. of video list response. And now the implementation starts, right? So normally, look, look at this uh, this way. This is the only place in our code base that will use Akka HTTP, like the client. Nothing will leak. Nothing in, in the rest of the code will know about that this is Akka. So that's, that's probably what we really, really uh, want to have. We don't want Akka to spread everywhere. We don't add, want to any library to spread anywhere. Uh, so we, we can have this HTTP here, which is an Akka thing, and a single request. Then we can have this HTTP request Right, all those, all those things, and uh, yeah, have method get URI. I won't be doing URIs because I will make so many mistakes that it's not possible to do. But okay, something like that we'll we'll do do it later. And then of course we need to uh, what we need to do with this result. We need to unmarshal it, right, and we need to have yeah, YouTube video, resp video res response. So that's kind, of, that's kind of thing. And of course, again, the compiler is, is, is uh, saying to us that we need some things, right? We need a materializer, we need actor system, but again, we only need them here. So we can, we can, say, we can say that, okay, implicit uh, system, you've probably done, that, done, done this before, uh, system, actor system, so our main, will need to know that uh, this needs to be created. It could be created here. It depends on how you want to approach things. And of course, we need some uh, materializers and things like, uh, things like that. And we need uh, YouTube, YouTube response. So this is, this is kind of uh, how it looks like. We need a materializer, which is just an actor materializ materializer. And we are getting uh, the execution context from the dispatcher. But other than that, if you, if you, look, at it, if you look at this one, it looks pretty familiar, right? It's just like HTTP. But when you look at that, uh, it returns future of video list response. And what we need to have is IO. So that's why we need this, this kind of uh, trick here. Uh, IO in CATS has something like from, from future. And if, if you want to like delay the future and uh, so that it waits 
to, to be run until the end of the world, until we save, uh, until we run and save run something, right? Then we need to do something like, like that. And this, this, will, this will work. Now the, the types compile fine. So this is how it works. And the URI is just the YouTube URI we get with some key and video ID. That's, that's, that's all. And this is our client. Again, one slide, one screen. Nothing more is needed in order to make YouTube calls to the real server. Nothing, is, well, nothing more is needed. And in order to use it, we just say a KCP video client and uh, what they are. Uh, it needs YouTube API, YouTube URI, YouTube API key, which we already have. And it needs this actor system, which will, which will create here, because we are using ACA. Uh, system, actor system, right? And that's, that's probably it in, in terms of uh, implementation. What do, we, what do we need? We need collection view, and we need, and that's all, probably. We need some, some collection things. And we, we can have something, something like that uh, here. Collection view is the one that we implemented, the type class. But we also need to have a put, which I don't, didn't show you, but works exactly the same. It's collection update, is save collection ID, and the collection. Right, so that's that's the one that I didn't implement, but it looks very very similar to, to the ones that we did. It's exactly the same mechanism. And all collections view again the same mechanism, so we can we are we are able to fetch all the collection IDs that are stored. It's a kind of uh, thing that maybe it's not so cool, but we have it here and we know about that. And we need this in-memory in list state. The, the one, just a list of, of, of collections in memory, but can be anything. So all the other functions, clients, loggings, and our statistics uh, functionality doesn't know anything about this state, right? So it's just chosen here. And all of those things are, are, chosen, uh, are chosen here. So that's how we use it. That's how we use this program. It should compile fine. And uh, that, that's, that's a whole program. It uses HTTP. It's using the default logging strategy using in-memory list collections. So that's, that's, how it, that's how it works. So again, what we did is we moved many things from the side effect things into the pure world. That's what, what, what we wanted to do to make them isolated, to make them testable, to make them readable, easy to maintain, and all those things, right? By providing the algebras. So we, we used algebras to do any, everything business-related. Anything business-related was done using the algebras. But of course, when we started using that in the main function, we started to having compiler errors, and compiler errors that are helpful, because the compiler guided us into implementing those interpreters. And those in interpreters alone were uh, very, very, uh, uh, very, very nice and small, right? So they are also very readable, because they, they were fitting on one screen. I wasn't scrolling at all. And it's in presentation mode, so it's even smaller on the computer. So that's very, very small pieces of code that are isolated, and, but fit nicely together when you, they are used together in main, right? So algebra, an example of algebra, and interpreter that we implemented using IO from future. So we just are connecting those dots together. And that's all about the code. That's the whole application that we want to test. Okay, so that's, that's, that's all that we, uh, have written in, in Scala using this technique, and it's a real application that really works. That a connection between all those small components. Now we'll be plug, plugging and playing with those components because if we have such a possibility to just switch something from one library to another using like a small piece of code, then we can do a quick test with them, like performance test, for example. Which one is better, HTTP or HTTP4S, or where do we have pro performance problems uh, in, our, in our service? So that's, that's kind of things. There are several interpreters that uh, I implemented. HTTP I've shown you, but also we have Hammock and HTTP4S. We have uh, different state implementation in memory trimap. And uh, we also have a logger, logger that is like 1,000 per second. And it's dropping if the rate is higher. We'll see if it's needed. So let's make it fast. Let's make the server, server fast, service fast. And before I start, usually I'm doing those, those things on the computer, right? Uh, I will need to probably, uh, I will need to probably have, uh, have it plugged into the, uh, to the electricity. Because when we start doing those things, uh, 
it's getting uh, the batteries is really you know eating the life. So we'll be what we'll be doing is we'll be using that tool that is called that is called WRK. Please tell me who of you knows WRK. It's a one, one zero. Okay, so that, that's cool. That's when you that's when you learn things, right? So WRK is a Linux tool, and Unix probably. So it's on the Mac OS, it's on Linux, it's a command line tool. And you can use quickly to just test out this URL. In our case, this will be our service, right? the, the URL. What this kind of command line does, one thread is used, 16 connections are used, and during 30 seconds duration, the WRK are, is hitting with as many requests as possible, as many requests as possible in those 30 seconds. So it's a real load test on our application. And then present some statistics about the performance characteristics of the service. service. And dash dash latency also prints a nice latency report because we need latency. And async profiler, who knows async profiler? It's a JVM tool, okay? It's a very, very nice thing, because what it does, it connects to your Java process and probes 100 times a second or so, uh, and every probe, it, check, it checks what the CPU is doing. And then it provides us with this nice graphical representation of the whole service, a flame graph. So graphically, what are the performance characteristics of the service? Flame graphs are read from the bottom, and I will be showing you some of those, those flame graphs uh, some of those flame graphs uh, when, we are, when we'll be doing the performance test and how to read them and how to get some conclusions out of them. So version one, the one that we just implemented. Akai HTTP is on the server and on the client. We are logging all the things, right? Every interpreter is just passing the, the log to the logger, SL4J, and we have in-memory linked uh, list. So what kind of performance characteristics will it, will it have? So let's first... Uh, Let's first add our other interpreters. So we'll be doing live coding. Yeah, and SBT run. So we are doing SBT run. The code is, as you see, exactly the same. So uh, this, this is our implementation. Default logger, a HTTP client, and in-memory list state. Statistics is guess stats look the, look the same. So it's exactly the code that we are running. Uh, some, yeah, and it's run. So when you, when you look here, you can see 8080 port, it's running. Now what we can do is we can use WRK in order to load test. So we are doing, adding like thousands of, of collections first, like using the put on our HTTP, and then using one thread and 16 connections in order to, to push it to maximum. And in order to use uh, in order to use async profiler, what we need to do is we need to provide the process, the process uh, ID, which is uh, which can be found using the JPS here. So I'm doing what I did here. I just did a pro uh, got a JPS process ID using JPS from our uh, SBT launch jar, which is the SBT just, and uh, then we did some profile profiling. 10 seconds duration of profiling, and we said that the output should be in this TMP uh, flame graph, right? And the test ended, and we can see the output of the WRK here. So here's the output of the WRK. Uh, so one thread and 16 collections, and here are statistics. We got uh, like 258 uh, requests per second, and the 99th percentile latency was 157 milliseconds. Average 63 milliseconds. Like so, uh, 7,000 requests in 30 seconds, around 2558. Using the implementation we have, right? This is the this is the the statistics for this process. And let's look at the flame graph. Yes, open it. Okay. So that's that's how the flame graph looks like. I'll just make it bigger here. Yeah. So again, this is this is the flame graph. Maybe it's not so so visible. I will try to uh, try to make it bigger. So you you read it from the bottom, 
and uh, all the probes or, or the or, or the samples are uh, in at the bottom right so all the C cpu probes were hi were hit uh, with uh, uh, with the uh, with like 1000 samples are in the report but then we go up and we see that only 86% of those samples were inside a fork join worker thread, right? So very, very low level thing. So we are going up and up, and we can see that it's ACA, mailbox, exec. So we see exactly what are the, what are the uh, specific things that CPU was doing. So the whole, uh, the whole graph of, of execution, the stack trace, right? And what we are doing usually is we are going up and up and, and searching for the first thing in our package, right? Because we usually tend to trust the libraries when it comes to per performance characteristics. Of course, of course there, there, there can be some mis mis uh, misusage. But right now, we don't trust ourselves first. So we don't trust um, our ourselves. And we see, when you look at it, that the logging, default logger, uh, was responsible for like how much? 54% of time. So, our application did those 300 requests per second, but CPU and at uh, more more than half of the probes in the CPU, what CPU was doing was it was just logging the hell out of things. Okay, so but just by using this simple approach to flame graphing, what we are able to do is we are able to uh, to quickly see what can be a problem, and because we did it in a modular way, in a modular way, we can quickly fix it. So again, what we did, we did the first version, eight, around 8,000 requests, uh, 283 requests per second, as you can see, it's, it's pretty, it's, it's, it's the same when you, when you do it multiple, multiple times. And we got this flame graph, uh, when, I, when I run it, previously it was 70%, but still the bottleneck will always be uh, available for, for, you, for, for you, no matter how many times you, you run it. So what we can conclude from that? We need to change the logging, right? The whole logging, we need to change it. So let's change it from the normal logger that logs everything to a dropping logger with, uh, that, that has this rate uh, 1,000 and no more. So if you log more things in one second, one second than 1,000, then the other ones are dropped. So let's, let's try to do that. How, how hard could it be, right? So we, what we need to do is we need to use this a uh, new thing here, dropping logger, which hopefully is somewhere around here. If not, we'll just implement it. Yeah. So this is how the dropping logger, logger looks like. So as you can see, it's I.O., right? Logging I.O., so exactly extends the same thing. And here we are using this pending logs uh, pending logs functionality from Monix, uh, Monix atomic value. What it does, it just has this array buffer, which has nice like appending uh, functionality and getting all those things. And when the logs are, are where, we, where we have pending logs like less than 1,000, we just append this message. If there's exactly 1,000, we just add a log that said that we dropped some. And else, if there are more, we just, we just don't do anything, right? So a dropping logger. Again, just in this one file, in this one module, in this one piece of code, we just define the whole logging functionality. And no other place in the code knows about that, right? Okay, we could have an, a different algorithm right here. And we are in charge. We can do anything here, what we like in terms of logging. Again, this is interpreter, so it's a bad word, but it's so small that we are able to, to be hopeful about uh, understanding that. So now we have this new logger and we can just use it. And that's all, okay? That's, that's the one change I did. I implemented a new interpreter and changed one line, one line of code. And now I can just restart the SBT, right? Again, I will do this just once and uh, the rest, uh, I have five versions, the rest I will just show on the slides. But again, the whole process of how we approach this kind of thing. SBT run, it's, it's just on the computer, right? So uh, it may dif uh, behave differently on production. On production, you should have a different kind of, of, of test, right? The Gatling and things like that. Uh, maybe WRK in some cases. But this is development mode, right? You want to have some performance. So yeah, let's run it. 
Again, we run the, the new version with dropping logger, one line changed, really just one line changed, and then we are testing it using the same thing, adding uh, 1,000 collections and then running WRK, 30 seconds, and of course, uh, we need to get the J JPS, we need to get the ID, and we are running async profiler. All the links under the GitHub is, uh, are in the GitHub repository, I will link at the end, and uh, I will show you also how to repeat all those steps. So we, we, are doing, we are doing the 10 seconds profiling of the whole application using dropping logger. As you can see here, uh, dropping logger kind of works because uh, a dropping logger trying to fetch, but you can see that it kind of skips, right? After some time, it, it, doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really lock all the time as in the previous version, so we can see that something uh, uh, has worked so far. And we have a new, uh, we should have a new flame graph, and you can see that it, it looks different. And now we, we, we also go from the bottom, and we can see here, this is kind of cool, you can see that the, the green ones are Java, are your application but the red ones are a system. So for example, you can see here that 48% 40, of time that our threads were not doing anything. So this is your conclusion that our application is very, very IO heavy, right? It's very, very big amount of, uh, of things are doing uh, in, in the IO waiting for, for, for the stuff to, to come back. For example, YouTube, right? So that's, that's uh, what, we can, what we can do. And again, we are searching for our our code, which is right here, 12% uh, archive HTTP. And so it looks like in mem state, things like that. So we can, we can also get some conclusions out, out of it. Maybe too many, uh, many, maybe too many IO operations because the uh, unsafe park is, is too large, right? So our application is not doing anything, so we are not using resources as well. So what we can do, what we can do, we'll see, uh, the, re the results that we got, uh, the results that we got before, and the, the change that we, that we implemented was 8,000 requests. Now WRK showed us uh, much more. It should, should show us much more when you look at this. Yeah, here. Uh, after introducing the dropping logger, right? It, it's like 10 times more requests in those 30 seconds. So it's f f uh, 500 requests per uh, sorry, 3,000 requests per second, right? So I'm not lying to you. This is what really happened after changing one line, line, line of code. Now I'm moving strictly to the slides. So as you can see, we got like around 3,000 requests per second just by introducing the dropping logger. And of course, we got this, this new uh, flame graph, which is like 12% in, in my case was uh, for the fetching, a lot of fork uh, parking, sorry, uh, thread parking. And uh, so what we can do? We can try to change the video client, right? Because it's so easy, we can just, you know, guess. Okay, let's, let's change the video client. It's like a very, very simple change of code. We implemented the ACK HTTP one, right? Now we can just uh, use the hammock, hammock version. Hammock version, uh, hammock version, when you look at that, hammock is a library that is a purely functional HTTP client. It's in a, a type level incubator if you don't know about it. So this is how the implementation of the video client would look like in Hammock. So you can see it's request as exec as AO. So you choose, in Hammock, you choose the effect type you, 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 want to, you want to use. You can even use try. But other than that, it's very, very similar. It's just the Hammock specific things. It's a wrapper around Apache, uh, Apache Camel. So what we do is we just switch again in main, we just switch a HTTP client to hammock, right? And that's all. Again, one line of code, and again, we should SBT run and all the, those things. But when we do, we have this, the, these kind of results. So a, a little better, uh, we got uh, Apache inside hammock. So 96,000 uh, 96, requests, 99% uh, latency is 13 milliseconds five average, and uh, again, around 3,000 requests per second. So much better, but can we do better? When you look at the flame graph, you see now that you know, we introduced another bottleneck. And this time, the bottleneck is hammock, which is 
taking like 54% uh, of our processor, like half of the time the Async Profiler probed, uh, it encountered hammock. So what we need to do, we, we could change to another. But what we also can do is we introduced some caching, right? Because if you check one video, the same video uh, in like 20, 12, uh, 200 milliseconds away from each other, the chances are that the statistics are very similar. But you can, you can do some, some, some kind of caching. And because we used all those higher kind of types and F type and uh, higher, uh, higher order functions, we were able to also introduce this kind of change using one line of code. And one line of code, after doing the, the, this one li line of code change, because it's so plug and play and modular, we were able to achieve even more performance out of the same piece of code business-wise. Because we introduced caching, and caching is introduced at a, at a different level. So when you, statistics caching, it's again, it's a simple thing, uh, th that just takes a function that normally returns something and, th and then uses the fixed pool from, the, from, the, from Monix in order to re refresh that. And again, a simple module, just one piece of code, one line, of one, one line changes, and we get another great improvement, which is like 31,000 requests per second, right? And the same business code, different implementation of the, of, of the Fetching mechanism, that's, that's, that's all. It's one piece of code, so it's readable. It can be reasoned about in isolation. That's kind of what we are always striving for. And of course, again, this process continues. We get a new flame graph, and uh, it has some unsafe parts. So we can see that it still has some I.O. Um, so we could stop here, 31,000 requests per second. It's kind of nice, right? to have in a normal business application. It's, it's, it's more than, than enough, usually. But because we have like 10 minutes before we go home, so we can change the whole server. And 10 minutes it seems doable. Because what we can do is we can, we can try to change the ACK HTTP and replace it with HTTP4S. We could do something like that. And what do you think? If we have like modularity in our code that we introduce, is it, is it really, really easy to do? Yeah, it is. If you look at that, it's just, it's just checking inside the main application, you are just doing this, right? Hammock, sorry, not hammock, uh, HTTP4S. 4S server, if it's in this branch, but it should be, yeah, HTTP4S server. Right, so this kind of server, again, it's it's like a next step. So I'm I'm showing it as a as a next example. So so you can follow up because as you can see, it doesn't use I/O. So we are moving some of the interpretation into the pure world. So you can see it's saying concurrent effect. It's, it's a little bit more complex, but the technique is the same. The technique is exactly the same. So in order to have HTTP server. In the signature, you can see exactly what your type needs to have in order to be able to implement the HTTP server. So I'm showing this to you, that it's still one side, but it's more readable, it's more on the pure side, it's the last change we do, we are just replacing one line of code and trying to, uh, to test it. And when it tests it, it turns out that in case of our application, because it, it, it's not universal, right? We are just testing in our case. Now, in, in our case, HTTP4S is better in this current version because we got every, every uh, characteristic is better. Nine milliseconds of 99% uh, latency. Average latency is less than one millisecond. So it's, it's kind of cool. It's very, very fast, right? And uh, yeah, almost 40,000 requests per second in this small application without changing the, the code, uh, the business-related code at all. We just switched the server, we just switched the client, we just switched the logging algorithm, and all in Scala. And all of those things can be easily reasoned about and easily tested. Again, this is a flame graph. And of course, if you have more time before you go home and you don't want to do anything today just to optimize things, you, you, could, you could do that, right? But we will stop here. So before I 
go to conclusions. I probably, some of you have, uh, most of you probably have object-oriented uh, object -or -oriented background. And when you were listening to me and, and, and looking at the code, you probably have some kind of feeling that this has already existed before. So I want to talk about inventions that already exist before I address your issue. So like two years ago, a company uh, produced a, a new like, product. They marketed it in this way, that you can have a piece of silence with you all the time. So if you are in a loud room or a very noisy, no, noisy environment or lights were too big, you can always have your, your room with you, like peace of mind. So you just set it up here when you feel stressed. You just set it up here and you go lie down, read a book, no, no noise, no, no lights. Either. So your peace of mind. So this is a product they marketed. And internet is sarcastic, of course. So uh, yeah, this is a tent. You just invented a tent. Okay, so cool down. So this is the first invention that already existed. The second one, I, I will show free. The second one is shuttle, shuttle lift. They marketed it this way. This was two years ago. Cheaper taxi that drives on fixed routes. So what did they in, uh, invent? What did they invent? What do you think? A bus. <laughs> they invented the bus. It's, 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 it's exactly, exactly the same. Some bus goes a, a fixed route. You can hop on and hop off, right? So yeah, they invented the bus. And now the third example Algebras and interpreters, right? So I'm telling you that it's cool, cool and isolated and you can implement your own isolated things. But what did I invent that already existed? Interface, right? Interface and implementation. This guy is talking about. So I want to, uh, I want your like, three or three minutes, use the three or four minutes I have here to really explain the difference between object-oriented interface and implementation with this, what I've been showing for the last hour and 20 minutes, okay? So let's do it. This is a Scala FP version. This is the, what, what you've seen so far, you are bored with that and all that, but it's exactly the same as we wrote it. This is the implementation in Scala. What I did is I also implemented the same thing in Java, you know, because I'm like that. Just, just to make sure that it's not possible to do it as well as this, okay? So I won't lie at any conference talks at all, I hope. Uh, so if you are a better Java programmer than me, then if I'm lying, just let me know uh, straight away after the talk. And this is the Java implementation. It's not, it's, you don't have to look at that, right? Uh, it, it, it's the same kind of amount of, of, uh, of code. Uh, no, it's not, but, uh, this does exactly the same thing that, that Scala one. So it's a more, more code, obviously. It uses a completable future, so it's, it's more calls and, and, and so on and so forth, but it works. But the, what, what, what is different? The difference is in the interfaces. So this code uses the, the same approach, modular interfaces, the one that I wanted to, uh, to show you. Video client, the trait that we had, right? It's, it needs to be completable future of video list response. Completable future of optional collection, right? C, no F. So that's the difference, and this is the main difference. Because look, we need to choose the effect type. And what, I, what did I tell you about choosing the effect type? If inside those functions we need to choose the effect type, then we can do anything. We can send people to Mars. That's, that's kind of cool, but in, not in uh, the marketing uh, kind of application that we did, right? So if we chose the type and we did in Java, then any programmer later, even, even we, six months from now, can just add something because, you know, there's a pressure from business, right? Do it quick. Do it now. As fast as possible. And if you use this version, you can do that. That's kind of cool because your code is better. It's more maintainable. Now you need to sit down and let the compiler guide you. 
how to do this new change. Not a lazy way of just slapping another flat map here or there, or then compose in Java, in a computer computer. You need to kind of think about the structure of your, of your application. So, so this is how, if it is real product used by real people, and it's on production, and you want to change something, you probably want to have this maintainability, testability, and so on and so forth, and not at the beginning, throughout the lifetime of the application, right? And this helps you with that, because it's constrained so much that you can just slap around the new additions all over. So this is the main difference you are using F and this constraint and everything is the con in, in signature and you are sure that nothing happens inside the uh, implementation because it can't, right? And dependencies is the second thing, m maybe not so major. In Java you need to like, in the constructor, pass all those collection view video client logging and it's in a different place than your function. In the Scala approach I described, you have all in the dependencies inside the function, right? So you just look at the signature and you have all the things that you need, really, in, in terms of the types, the side effects, the purity, and all that. So not an interface. It's just a different, a different approach, the same kind of objective, but the, the Java one, the, the object-oriented one, is like one step behind, right? Because higher kind of types are not there. So we can abstract over more things in, in Scala, and we use that to our advantage. So we are using F to constrain ourselves to make better isolated code. And that's why we could do all those nice things. What have we done? We changed the infrastructure de details. The core logic stayed the same. I repeated that over and over, but that's true. We just wrote it and then stayed the same without changing anything. So if you think about that, if, you, if, if we can replace all those details without changing the logic, that, that's a pure win, right? The logic for the business, the logic hasn't changed, so the tests, obviously, uh, were also not changed. So think about that. We changed the HTTP client, but we don't have to change the tests for the business logic. We changed the server, we don't have to ch uh, change the tests for the business logic, because business logic doesn't know anything about what we used. A like HTTP, a like server, HTTP for a server, play, anything. So that's, that's a pure win. That's what we really, really strive for. So as functional programmers, we usually divide the code in those two worlds, right? It's the, the side that, that is pure and the side that is side effectful. And in the pure side, we use uh, F-type, we use uh, very constrained uh, implementations and we can use unit tests because there are no side effects, right? Unit tests or property-based tests, but usually very quick, very fast to run and very, very stable tests. But of course, we still need to have this, this uh, like implementation of the server, we still need to have implementation of the client, those, or logger, those things are doing the side effects, those things are really calling something in the external world. And we need that in our applications, as few as possible, but we need that. They are very small, and they are testable. And what we do at Regality Games in those, those situations, we are using integration tests for the interpreters. And the small addition, we are ending, ending very, very quickly, but just, just a quick reminder, or a quick uh, tip, how to do that. So have, how many of you know test containers? It's a Java project, but easily used in Scala has a Scala, no, nobody, that's cool, that's really cool. So what it does, it runs the Docker for you, okay? We want integration tests to be real. We don't want to mock that YouTube server will return something because those tests doesn't really test anything besides the mock. So we want, want to have like a Docker image that is exactly the API that we are going to use. So it's a better kind of mock because it's a real server. So we really can change, check something, right? So in, the, in, this, uh, in this project, I, what I did, I just created a Docker image for the YouTube implementation, and this is the whole test. This is the slide. This is the whole test, no, nothing more. So if you are used to Mokito or all those things and you have like big, big amount of mocks, that's not possible because we have small, small interpreters. This interpreter has just one responsibility. 
it just fetches the statistics for a particular video. So you can have a Docker image with all the videos and statistics. This is your kind of mock, but it's a real one, it's Docker. And Docker test containers will just uh, bring it up, run your test, knowing that it's, it's up and provides you with the port and all that, so you don't have to wait for that. You look at the third line, wait for listening port. So it will only run your test when the Dockers are all up and all that. And of course, there are many, many uh, different servers you can use. We are also, for example, testing uh, OAuth uh, clients with that. So we have like our OAuth server in Docker, and this, this way the servers can, can test the OAuth. So that's kind of very, very quickly and, and easily. And it's pretty stable, because it's not doing many, many things at, at, at once. So I really, really recommend this, this kind of approach. So it's just one interpreter tested again against the uh, Docker, and all of those other things that are pure, tested using normal unit tests and property-based testing. Again, test containers recommend a lot. So what you learned? Modularity, how the modular application can be written, what kind of techniques can we use, and what are the benefits of it? That's fast development cycle, fast feedback loop, using this kind of uh, approach that I show you, and in terms of performance, it's also faster service, because if we can change at so big things in our applications like server or client so quickly, why wouldn't we just check it, right? So that's a plug and play. And you can learn more. This, uh, this thing here, uh, Influencer Stats repository, it has the whole readme that is going step by step uh, with all those things I uh, shown you. So exactly all those five steps, implementations, how to use async profiler, how to uh, read flame graphs. And the flame graphs, SV, those are just SVG files. I opened them in Safari, right? And they are SVG files with the JavaScript inside, so you can click around those, those files. So if you, if you don't want to generate them on your, uh, yourself, you can just hop on this repo and, and see them first without, you know, without uh, spending so much time on, on the setup. But if you want to generate them uh, in the readme, I also have uh, all those things uh, written up, written down, sorry. So when you look at that, it's, it's pretty, it's, it's the repository I linked. You can see all those things are there. You can play around and repeat all the steps. And the Java implementation is there, and Scala implementations, all the in interpreters are there as well. That's all from my side. I hope you enjoyed this, this, this long talk and hope you learned something. Uh, I'll, I'm here until the end of the conference, so just catch me up in the hallways and please uh, talk with this, discuss and uh, give me some, some feedback and, and questions. Uh, I'm Michal, this is my Twitter, shout out there or ask questions there if you want. Uh, here's my blog uh, and thank you very much for your attention. So any questions, right? Do you have any questions? えっと、単体テストを書くときにあの指定するFの方とかがもしあれば教えていただきたい、よく使っているFの方があれば教えていただきたいなと思いました。So the question is uh, F-type and unit tests. And uh, yeah, so we the F-type is just used on the implementation side, right? So the production code that you see in tests, you usually want to fix the type to something. And there are different schools to do that. Some people use ID, right? Some people uh, use ID with some imperative code because it just tests. It's, it's, it's for some people, for, for sure. You can use like either type, which, uh, which is like pure value and the error. Or you can do try, you can, tr you, you can use try. You can do whatever suits your team, particular team. So I've seen people su succeed with uh, the, uh, the ID. I've seen some state monad even approaches, but F can be anything. So it can be a state, trans state monad and a monad transformer because it's just a test. So it can be slower a bit. Uh, you don't have to worry about allocations and all those things. So uh, F is on the production side of the code that is used. And in the test, you need also, you are the user, you need to choose what kind of effect type do you use. It's usually not IO, you can, but it's kind of imperative. Uh, but you can be doing either monad transformers, reader T with option and, and things like that, right? さっきデータベースアクセスで SQL の方にロジックがたくさん乗っかっているみたいな場合だと今回のアプローチは使えないのかなというふうに思ったんですけどその時にこう工夫する方法というかうまくやっていく方法があれば教えていただきたいなと思
So to be, uh, to be sure, uh, the question is about uh, using SQL, SQL in this kind of approach. Okay, so SQL is a side of uh, SQL database, and when you fetch data from it, it's a side effect like any other side effect. So what you do is you provide this, the same approach like the client. So imagine that in this application, the statistics were in the SQL database, and the whole application stays the same, really stays the same. You just need to check the video client, change the video client to SQL. So when you look, when, you, when we go, go back to, to the project, when we do HTTP client, video client, here's an ACA, and it's using future and IO. So you, you would use some kind of, uh, I don't know what, what your Hikari product probably, right? Something like that in, for the SQL. And uh, you, would, you would put Hikari here, your SQL, uh, JDBC, here or or anything like 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 that, and the library can be put here even if it's not functional, and uh, return the the type in the row in the I/O type, for example, right? And that's all. So the business logic again doesn't know whether it's a YouTube server or a SQL server with all those statistics. That the approach is exactly the same because taking something from the SQL server is just another side effect because you are calling the database. It can fail. It can time out all those things. <laughs> okay, so okay. You, you, we are talking about triggers and all those things, right? You are in, inserting something into database, and then there is a trigger and does something in the database. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, if you can't refactor, then probably I would suggest moving towards the test containers approach and having kind of simulation of your of your database uh, there, uh, because you you can have a MySQL container and put all the triggers inside. It's more integration kind of, but you still need some test testability. And uh, then there is some logic in your interpreter, which you know about. And you, you need to kind, kind of say that in the code, that there is a logic there. And it will be seen because somehow interpreter knows more than it should be from the business logic. And I think that this kind of approach can also be used to refactor one trigger and another from this interpreter into the pure pure functionality, but but yeah, it's hard. And I, um, if you haven't used this approach before, then I wouldn't suggest using it to refactor because it's like next level, right? First, you need to create some application from scratch using this technique. This is what I've uh, encountered when I worked with uh, beginners in this technique. They need to create their, their application first, like a new one or a small service. And only then they are able to refactor because they already know benefits, they already know what to look for. Thank you very much. Very, very, very good question. Thank you. <laughs> and more questions. Okay, no more questions. And thank you. Thank you very much for staying with me so long. It's a 90 minute talk, it's a very long one. And uh, thank you for your patience. And uh, see you in the hallway. Thank you very much. <laughs>